The Shadow of the Erdtree DLC for Elden Ring has finally been revealed after two years. What's up? I'm Syro, and I scrubbed every single frame by frame and analyzed every detail and pixel from the official gameplay trailer for the Elden Ring DLC. We were shown new items, new enemies, new areas, new bosses, new lore, and even more. A lot of what I'm about to tell you has never been covered before. Not everything, but all I ask is that you watch with a blank slate from start to finish. From just the opening sequence, we see what is clearly Mogwin's Palace, where most people expected that this area is where you access the DLC from. Mogwin's Palace is where you fought Mogwin, the Lord of Blood, with the familiar cocoon that has a deceased Mikola inside it, who is dead in body but alive in spirit, unlike Godwin, for example, who was killed in spirit, but his body remains alive, sprouting death root, as most of us already know. Now, we aren't sure exactly who is standing here, but I've seen some assumptions of it being Ronnie or Melina, but their outfit doesn't quite match either of them. The lower part of this outfit having some crests and patterns of design, where in the same area, Ronnie's and Melina's do not. So this could potentially be someone new, unless they did a full outfit change, which I doubt. In the middle of editing this video, a brand new article just came out where Miyazaki confirms a lot of important lore details in a Japanese interview. The first part is him confirming directly that the players will need to defeat Radon and Mogwin to access the DLC from Mikola's Cocoon. So this is no longer a theory and is now the confirmed place where the DLC starts. There's also a lot more regarding Marika, the unique Lion Dancer boss, and details about the DLC's location, confirming that it does not take place in the past, and that the current events of the game do not affect the DLC's story in any way. Meaning that this story taking place in a distant land of shadow where Marika first became a god is a completely separate side story. So I'll make sure to try and correct any inconsistencies there might be. Pure and radiant, he wields love to shrive clean the hearts of men. This is the first sentence that we hear in this DLC trailer. I want to make it clear that this is directly referring to Mikola, who out of all the demigods is the only one relatively trying to help anyone out of sheer kindness, including trying to find a cure for his sister, Melania, of her Scarlet Rock curse. He shows people kindness and love to help purify them, even allowing Loretta, a royal carrion knight, to bring her Albanarix to his Halig tree in search of a safe haven for their eventual salvation. The narrator takes a fearful shift in tone here. There is nothing more terrifying. Seemingly afraid of this power of kindness that Mikola has, because most other gods would just force or threaten people to obey them and not actually win them over, so their subjects might not always idolize them directly, whereas people would literally die for Mikola out of respect, as even the Halig Tree soldier Ashes state, when weakened, they explode to deliver a last ditch attack. This was a bitter revelation, discovered by the desperate soldiers who awaited the return of their lord to the rotted Halig Tree. May the flesh of our deaths guide Mikola's return. The spirit ash description of Mikola's soldiers from his Halig tree say that they chose to do this. They weren't taught to blow themselves up by anyone. They came up with this idea themselves to die out of frustration, since they didn't know where or why Mikola left them. And they just hoped that somehow their violent deaths guide Mikola back to the Halig tree, as they don't realize that he was kidnapped by Mogwin in the cocoon that we see at the start of the trailer. That's how powerful Mikola's influence is. We also see another example of his power from the bewitching branch, which is an item that instantly charms enemies to fight and give their lives for you, just by breathing it in for a few seconds. This was created by Mikola, directly with his incantations of unalloyed gold, demonstrating his fearsome power of control that inspires or charms people with unwavering loyalty for him to their graves. Melania was always protecting Mikola, but when she went to go fight Radon, that's when Mogwin snuck in and took Mikola away from the Halig tree during his sleep, which is how his cocoon ends up in Mogwin palace in the first place if you didn't already know. This shows how Mikola isn't physically strong enough to protect himself, but with a power like control or manipulation, he has a mental strength of steel. The next shot after Mog's palace is the first of many brand new locations. The description of the video gave us some breadcrumbs to follow, that this specific shot is likely what's known as the Land of Shadow, a place obscured by an earth tree similar to the one in the capital, except this one is clearly destroyed. There's a lot of theories that this could be in the past, another dimension, 
a dream world, etc. But what we do know is directly stated by From Software in the description of this video, stating that this is where the goddess Marika first set foot. This is extremely important and likely means that this is where Marika was born, her birthplace being the Land of Shadow. At the very end, we could hear a voice say, Come now. I couldn't place this voice at first, as it sounds similar to Ronnie or Melina, but I feel like it's not either. It was also a little too raspy and a bit deeper. That's when it hit me. This voice might very well be the first snippet of what Mikola's voice actress sounds like. His voice actress is even credited on IMDb as Naomi McDonald, who is a female British voice actor that specializes in voicing with accents and young children or adolescents. This isn't even her first Souls game either, as she was in Dark Souls 2 and a separate VR from software game known as Deracine. It's very common for female voice actresses to voice young boys boys to portray them as youthful sounding. She even played a young boy in The Witcher 3. Oh, that old hag don't speak to strangers, and you're a stranger. Come now, touch the withered arm, and travel to the realm of shadow. I will not be far behind you. May we meet again. But with that in mind, this means that Mikola wants us to touch his dead body since he's still alive in spirit and is referring to his own withered arm in the third person. This is because his soul has separated from his body. He asks the player to do this to teleport them to the realm of shadow, which is probably how he describes the land of shadow as we're told, because all Elden Ring characters speak with old English phrases. When he says realm, the word realm is being used in this context to mean a distant kingdom, not another dimension or plane of existence nor dream. This especially makes sense if it's somewhere that Marika has physically stepped foot in. The official description illustrates the war in this area as unsung, which has the connotation of not being celebrated or praised, which can either mean mean it was an unjustified war, or not necessarily an important war, but a war of many. It also reads as if Mesmer was the one who put a stop to these wars by being responsible for the massive burnt and charred Ur tree that we are shown towering over everything, casting a shadow in this massive shot of the region. The Ur trees typically generate light and are a primary light source that are more important than the sun, but after being burnt down, the light would likely fade away and instead become an eyesore and consume the surrounding area in its shadow hence Shadow of the Erd Tree being the name of the DLC. It's also interesting to note that in this beautiful shot, we see some wide areas that are green and flourishing, which stands out very easily compared to the mostly sepia-toned land that is all in crumbled structural ruins with tombstones, dead trees, and roots all over scorched earth style. But this particular area seems to somehow avoid most of that, despite it being just as close to everything else around it. It looks as if it was protected by what appears to be a veil that comes more from the sky above the tree itself and less from the tree directly, almost like the canopy that we see in the location of the queen's bedchamber in the capital of Lindale. The queen being Marika, who likely designed her bedchamber to replicate the old Erd tree here as a memento mori, which is when someone keeps death at the forefront of their thoughts as a reminder that nothing is permanent. In fact, this veil was just confirmed by Miyazaki directly in an interview to actually be hiding the land of shadow from the rest of the world. So this is likely an area that cannot be seen from the outside due to it being covered with the veil. The veil is not casting a shadow but the veil appears like it's a spell being used to hide away the land forever, almost like metaphorically sweeping it under the rug. It seems like Marika is trying to hide her mistakes from the world, but still doesn't want to forget what happened. Some extra details in this shot include a mysterious open flame that is just constantly burning, which could be proof that the Land of Shadow Erd Tree was actually burnt down directly like we see in the official art of Mesmer here, where it's actively being burned as he sits on a throne in front of it. Lastly, for this shot, we even have some large structures that look like they were constructed to support the falling Erd tree, or at least collect what is spilling out of it. That was a lot for such a giant shot, but now let's look at the next smaller scenes where we see the same area at nighttime with a mysterious symbol in front of what is most presumably a player wearing an outfit that looks like the Carrion Night set, but also has some very unique features like being mostly neutral colors instead of blues and the unique helm crest at the top. I haven't seen anyone talk 
talk about this symbol next to them either. But this could be a lot of things. I assume it's a logo of a new faction or religion that belongs to this other Erd tree and does not belong to the current Erd tree, which is the Golden Order Fundamentalists. This was also more or less confirmed by Miyazaki's interview. He stated that there was a culture that existed before the Golden Order and that the Lion Dancer character is derived from that culture, so the symbol likely belongs to a completely separate culture that we haven't seen before. We then immediately cut to a shot of what I believe to be some new, hopefully friendly NPCs, as what appears to be a woman knight based on the armor and outfit, wielding a really cool-looking greatsword or potentially colossal sword, with a distinct red sky similar to Caleb's in the background, but this is probably just a shot of the Land of Shadow with sunset lighting as this area is already dark even during the day. Scientifically speaking, red light is also the color that travels the furthest in regards to the visible light spectrum. The red wavelengths are the longest compared to any other visible color, with blues and violets being the shortest wavelengths. It makes sense, logically, that a place without the grace or light source of an Erd tree would most likely feature a warm color palette because the barely visible light that exists here has to travel extremely far from wherever its already dim light source is coming from. This is definitely an intentional design choice because because it's actually why sunsets are red in real life, which helps represent how void of light the Land of Shadow truly is and how far the light has to travel to even get here, making it very deserving of its name. This next scene made me really happy to see a more rotund looking NPC, as I immediately felt a resemblance towards the Onion Knights of previous Souls games with the wider armor sets and cheerful demeanor. Just visually, this knight looks far less intimidating than the previous one, simply putting together pots instead of holding a sword, and looking up to presumably the Erd tree in the Land of Shadow that was burnt down. This might be the NPC to give us more context for everything that's happened here. Okay, this part was very brief, but there's actually a lot in it. Elephant in the room, these are clearly St. Trina's lilies, and this is likely a soporific poison swamp, similar to the Scarlet Rot swamps, but instead will put players to sleep if you spend too much time in it. You can clearly see some shallow water or swamp juice surrounded by what are clearly St. Trina's lilies, which are used in the base game to craft and imbue your weapons with an effect that puts people to sleep. Miyazaki confirmed in the earlier interview that there will be a new poison swamp of sorts, but one that he hopes will inspire others to not hate this poison swamp compared to the previous one he's made, as he realized he really loves making swamps and wants to share that feeling with us, the players. Regardless of if this person is an actual player or NPC on the ground, I noticed their armor bears a striking similarity to the Zamor armor sets that the ancient Knights of Zamor wear, whose armor description reads, armor worn by Knights of Zamor, hailed as heroes in the war against the giants. The Knights of Zamor are an ancient group that have been at war with the giants since time immemorial, which means that they've existed and been fighting longer than anyone can really remember why, what for, or even when it started. But if the armor is essentially Zamor armor, it could confirm the idea of the giants being at war again in this region, much like how they were in other regions. So it's not too far-fetched to believe that this could be a type of ancient Zamor armor. Now, this is another large shot that has a lot of people speculating. First off, the design of this area is glaring glaringly similar to the interior of Raya Lucaria Academy, or similar locations in the eternal city of Noxtella. There's a notable violet hue crystal being used as a light source, and we can actually find these scattered about in present-day Raya Lucaria Academy. We also see candles whose flames resemble a white ghost flame, like the ones in Noxtella, but we can only tell so much from these brief shots. The next couple scenes are a bit lighter in detail, as this area looks similar to the destroyed trees pattern, but on the floor instead, as the player approaches a clearly abandoned castle or fort, illustrated by how overgrown and disheveled it looks. These two characters in the painting are very unfamiliar, and this painting might be found in that castle. I noticed the man in the painting is exactly the same person getting impaled by runes towards the end, in a similar fashion to Marika in the Radagon fight. We can tell they are the same person by the crest or medallion on his chest. Who he is exactly is unclear. I see this as most likely being the parents of Marika, because this woman is pregnant, as my girlfriend pointed out, signified 
by her hand holding over a bump in her belly, but her face is intentionally hidden. To be honest, this old guy looks like a completely average sized human with no special physical traits to take note of, unlike the height or mass that all demigods and gods seem to have. We know from the game that Marika is the same stock as the Newman, which means if these are her parents, it would make sense. Because these must also be Newman, which are quite literally just a unique race of humans, but still human nonetheless. Not gods, not demigods. Also, Newman do not originate from the lands between where the main events of Elden Ring takes place. The Newman come from outside our playable region just like the Land of Shadow is outside our playable region as well. I believe the Newmen traveled from their home region to the Land of Shadow, birthed Marika there in their new kingdom, which explains how she first stepped foot there. And they likely fled after the Erd Tree was burnt down, which might be how Marika ties into this DLC, as she is explicitly mentioned by the developers here in the trailer description. This next shot with all of the pots hanging from chains is unclear, but I notice whenever we see pots in this DLC, none of them are alive. Nor sentient like how Alexander and other living jars appear. Visually, these jars look almost identical, but these are completely lifeless, which could be intentional for the context of the DLC. This area looks like it reuses some similar assets found in dungeons like the Gelmir Hero's Grave, with all the lava and vertical descending, as well as the stone wall interiors. The player is dressed in the prisoner class defaults, wielding a rapier and another mysterious item, which looks like a sword with a really long cross guard. I'm unsure if this is a new weapon, because I've never seen anything like the sword in their offhand. I thought it was the Naginata, but the Naginata has a much longer hilt. Regardless, we have direct confirmation of new legacy and smaller dungeons in this DLC from Miyazaki, so it's almost guaranteed that this is just a preview of those new smaller dungeons, as they all use similar assets. This massive castle looks like it could hold a city's worth of people similar to Lindale. We see some direct destruction, almost like the city is dissolving and breaking apart. Meanwhile, there's more lush and vibrant foliage right beside it showing a clear inconsistency of areas that are destroyed versus areas that have been relatively untouched. I mean, just compare the trees here to the ones on the side. I don't think it's just visual lighting or colors at work here. These trees are notably more dull in color and even slender in shape compared to those flourishing trees over there. Right above these vibrant trees, we can see more of the veil-like canopy that I mentioned earlier really showing just how far it extends its reach. Now this next one might be a stretch, but seeing these spiraling pillars reminds me of the envoys and the unique designs of their horns. It's still really far off from being similar, but no one knows where the envoys originate from. Also, the floor down here looks like it has a similar glow to the floor we saw earlier, which represents the whole scorched earth theory that I had with Mesmer, who again we still haven't gone over yet and won't until the very end because there's a lot. But we have a few more things in the trailer before him, like this massive flaming garbage can, which if if you look closer, is actually filled with dozens of burnt corpses, desperately trying to escape. There's even an entire dragon corpse poking its head out from the center. I also speculated that this creature is sentient in the same way that the abductor virgins are sentient. Both have a similar stone-like face, but they appear more similar to a machine or robot than they do to any living creature. The worm enemy seen here literally sucking the life from the player looks like a common field enemy that you would run into in the overworld. But oh man, am I getting Bloodborne vibes from this enemy's design with the moon right next to it. This next major scene is finally our first look at one of many main bosses in this DLC. Miyazaki confirmed in the interview that there will be over 10 boss fights in this DLC. Well, judging by the shift in frame rate, this is clearly an introductory cinematic sequence, much like the sequence you see right before you fight Malaketh, for example, who is specified as a legend type boss that grants the player his remembrance, which makes it a reasonable assumption that this lion demon boss will also grant a remembrance to us. But let's talk about the actual fight itself. It switches from cinematic to actual gameplay footage right Right after. There's a lot going on, but at first glance it looks like a lion with the horns of an omen, but you can clearly see hands and feet are holding this monstrosity together, initially shifting and picking its head up and closing its mouth. I want to make it clear that the hands and feet that you see are not a part of the grafting process like Godric. These people are alive, and yes, I say people as in plural because there are multiple sets of arms and legs that are clearly moving and can even individually be seen in some shots here. It clearly takes inspiration from literal lion dancers in real life. Only, in the game, they are making a taxidermy lion costume using the real head of a lion instead. The real-life lion dance counterparts are performances that may bring good luck or chase away evil spirits, which reinforces the idea that this is a costume of sorts by its two sets of teeth, where the inner row looks uncanny because of how perfectly aligned all the teeth are, 
compared to the outside row. When the monster attacks with its mouth open, you can even see it doesn't have a tongue at all, reaffirming that these are likely dentures and these people have turned a living animal into a grotesque costume. There are also some more subtle features like how all its horns look like omen horns, which can easily be explained. But then there are some overlooked details like using literal deer antlers in some places, almost like they slap these on just to decorate the costume more, as well as the random armor and pieces of cloth covering its body. This clearly speaks to me as a DIY costume that utilizes real parts of creatures and animals alike, while being controlled by multiple people. However, I even noticed a statue of a lion with omen horns in the background of a later shot. So far, all of these lions bear a striking resemblance to what are known as golden lions, which is likely the animal that got its head ripped off by these people. We know a lot about the golden lions as creatures in the base game of Elden Ring, as there are lion guardians all throughout the game who even have omen horns of their own coming from their skulls. But these lions look a lot more malnourished and neglected, tied up with chains that have blades attached to them while also being shaded a dull gray and not as golden as they are described to be. Their horns are also shaved down, which could be a sign of being domesticated by their captors. A wild golden lion would let its horns grow freely, which is why there are a lot more horns on this boss lion's head, as they likely captured and killed a wild one to make their costume. The demigod Radon also constantly prides himself with the identity of golden lions more than anyone else, as his armor directly states that every piece depicts a golden lion in some way. A real golden lion is said to symbolize Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, and his beast Sirash, who ruled the battlefield in Radon's younger days. This made Radon obsessed with the golden lions and lion symbolism, where we specifically see a clear face of a lion with spiraling omen-like horns on his gauntlets. To make it abundantly clear, this is not Sirash, like I've seen some people speculate. It's just a golden lion, which happens to be symbolic of Godfrey and Sirash, but Sirash has some clear distinguishing traits like the scar on his eye that isn't present on this golden lion's face. But what's more terrifying is the fact that this lion can wield lightning, and even has a vaguely human appearance with glowing blue eyes, regular human-like teeth, and actual hair being swept out of its face and neatly braided, almost like it's attempting to look human. Now, so far you might have agreed with me here and there, but this next theory even I have a little trouble believing fully, and I invented it. My theory is that this isn't just a random costume, but one that is meant to portray something important or someone, representing far more than just a golden lion, since giving a lion a set of fake human teeth is a deliberate choice. This is not something you would do if you just want it to be a generic looking lion costume. It looks as if it's a crude representation of a real person, almost like a puppet of them. That's why they included actual fake teeth, to help give off the appearance of a real human. But what human meets the categories of golden lion symbolism, blue eyes, blonde hair, and a savage relentless attacking pattern? Clearly, we would think of this as Godfrey, as it's already been obviously stated that golden lions are direct symbolism of Godfrey and Sirash. And I almost 100% believe that. If it wasn't for the fact that this enemy wields lightning. This is a huge part of context clues, as not just anyone or anything can wield lightning. To backtrack a little, lightning was a power directly wielded by dragons given to Godwin. Long ago, three dragons attacked the capital of Lindale, which was confirmed in the lore of the base game and something you can see inside the city. These dragons being Landsax, Fortisax, and Grandsax. We know through item descriptions that Godwin defeated the ancient dragon Fortisax by himself, and instead of killing the dragon, he spared its life, and went as far as forming a friendship with Fortisax found in the Lightning Spear description. Fortisax would then give Godwin lightning powers, which were exclusive to dragons until this point. This would then create an ancient dragon cult within the capital who learned how to use lightning for themselves, signifying peace between man and dragon. The reason I bring this up is not just anyone or anything can use lightning. It came from dragons and was given to humans only after Godwin befriended them in the ancient dragon cult within the capital of Lindale. However, it states that these three dragons attacked the capital of Lindale, which is presumably really far off from where the Land of Shadow is located in the DLC. And if this Land of Shadow is really as far away and detached from the main events of Elden Ring as it suggests, then this puppet lion costume depicting Godwin's gold hair 
hair, blue eyes, and control of lightning is accurate, or at least as accurate as they can be considering no one from the Land of Shadow bore witness to these events. Unlike those who lived in the capital to witness the attack of Grand Sax and saw the ancient dragons directly. My theory is that this lion dancer boss puppet being controlled by a group of people symbolizes a perversion of the truth or real world events. Think of it like this. Imagine being a regular person in this world, born far away from Altus Plateau, and being told some random guy named Godwin with golden locks and blue eyes managed to completely overpower and domesticate the ancient dragons that have been trying to kill everyone for literal centuries. And on top of that, the dragons willingly gave him their powers. He didn't take it from them by force. How could anyone that hasn't actually seen the physical storytelling and truth of these events, or someone who wasn't in the ancient dragon cult of the capital genuinely believe that. But this is true to us, the player, based on what we witness and discover in the lands between. Had we not seen it with our own eyes, it would probably be very hard to believe. Word of Godwin's major victory and heroic tales would spread far and wide, even outside the lands between. But the truth would only get more diluted the further it travels. Furthermore, not a single enemy within the three minutes of this trailer wields lightning, except this one boss that I'm suggesting depicts what people believe Godwin is like that have never actually seen him and only heard of him through legendary battle stories like a fairy tale. Godwin the Golden was his name, so they used a golden lion's head. Blue can be seen in his eyes if you increase the brightness, which is tainted by death blight. So they gave it bright blue eyes. And they made the lion control lightning like the legends say Godwin did and how he blessed people with the power of lightning through the ancient dragon cult. The omen horns are already just a part of the golden lion, but could also be used to symbolize that Godwin's siblings are omens. Despite himself not being one, Godwin is directly related to Mogwin and Morgoth. It's a puppet or performance that poorly and loosely represents the misinformed pass down of history or perversion of truth and actual events within the world. And trust me, this theory is extremely hard to believe for even myself despite creating it. But I do think it fits in a lot of the right places. The only other person using anything similar to lightning in the trailer was this knight on a boar mount wielding purple lightning. But we know of purple lightning to be related towards gravity sorceries or gravity abilities, completely separate from the dragon cult lightning incantations. So even if this was purple lightning, it's almost exactly similar to the purple lightning of the fallen Starbeast Jaws Ash of War, which means that this character isn't related to Godwin or his legend, and that the lion dancer styled costume or puppet is likely just what these far off people in a distant land know of from the stories and legends they've heard. Hearing that there was a god who overthrew ancient dragons and was granted their power of lightning directly would be hard to believe for anyone who has not witnessed proof of it, and if anything would make him sound like a monster with immense strength if that's all they knew. Okay, my theory actually sort of holds up after Miyazaki just confirmed the origins of the Lion Dancer enemy in a new interview. Keep in mind, this is Google translating Japanese to English, so there might be some translation errors. Miyazaki says, There was a culture that existed before the Golden Tree, which I assume he means the main Erd Tree of Lindale. This lion character comes from a culture older than the Golden Order, so I hope you can feel the scent of a different culture, which means he hopes that we can tell that this culture is vastly different from the culture we know of being the Golden Order in Lindale. The culture the lion dancers come from is completely different and older than the Golden Order, which means it can be partially correct that this is an outsider culture recounting the events of a story or legend that doesn't belong to them, nor could they have ever witnessed proof of it. Hence why it feels like it could be a perversion of the truth if this costume is meant to represent Godwin like I stated. <sighs> okay, these next shots are really easily explained compared to what I just went over. But there is a scene of Mesmer right after this, so I'm pushing that to the very end to group everything about him together and fully unpack everything about him at the end. So let's blaze through these last few scenes and then talk about everything we can for Mesmer. In a few quick sequences, we see enemies that look like omen noblemen, designated by their numerous horns coming from their head and wielding a candle stand rather than an actual weapon. We have a sweet Ash 4 showcase that teleports behind you nothing personal style, which looks like it takes place in an underground cave area or at least a mountain pass. This next shot resembles the 
setting of Salia Crystal Town in Kaelid, inhabited by spectral enemies, but otherwise appearing abandoned. The player shown is wearing the Thief Starter Class equipment, dual-wielding throwing knives, which might be a new weapon or new consumable, as they come out way faster than regular throwing knives. I also made a distinction that this is actually an interior shot of the large decaying castle we were shown earlier. I confirmed this by analyzing the architecture of the pillars or columns. You can see a clear view of these pillars from the outside shot of this castle or city, which have a distinct spiral design wrapped around them, which is seen again here in this shot with the throwing knives from what's clearly a closer angle at street level inside of the castle. Next, we instantly have our attention grabbed by a bright flash of a pink butterfly incantation, which we can confirm is an incantation by the player holding a glowing seal to cast with, because if it was a sorcery, then the player would have to use a long stave instead. But finger seals fit in the palm of a player's hand. A lot of people assume that this is a spell that puts people to sleep, but if you notice, it's a bright pink color and not a pastel violet like we see in everything related to sleep. From this, we can gather that it's more similar to the Bewitching Branches Pink Mist, which means that this could possibly be a unique incantation given to the player by Mikola. This spell would deal AoE damage with a similar animation to the Bastard Star's Ash of War, but possibly inflict the charm effect on an enemy, as that is a unique power that Mikola has been able to give to things like the Bewitching Branch in the past. Then we got a quick roundhouse kick that I believe is a new type of weapon. Much like how there are fist weapons, now we might get feet weapons. This can loosely be confirmed by the same interview where Miyazaki officially stated that eight new weapon categories will be introduced in this DLC, just like this shot of a player throwing giant exploding pots that could suffice as another weapon category or most likely a new consumable item. A brand new heavy armor set with a Gatling gun styled crossbow that ramps up in firing rate the more arrows you shoot. It's hard to count the individual shots here as they're too fast, but if you count the area that looks like an ammo reserve, it appears to load around 12 bolts. Here we see what's likely a new type of incantation for rune bear spells, as when you use dragon spells, you take control of their head in a very similar animation to the way the rune bear head is being used, which is verified by the golden seal in the player's palm, which again is something you have to use in order to cast incantations as well as this really cool looking outfit underneath, where it seems like a new outfit with chains decorated around your waist. There's also a key detail that this rune bear isn't a regular rune bear and is cursed with some omen horns. There's been a lot of omen symbolism in this trailer, specifically four separate shots depicting omen horns on things that aren't actual omens themselves. This is likely because these horns are demonstrative of the crucible, which is where the omens inherit their horns from. This land of shadow could harbor a group of people or an entire civilization who still has their faith in the primordial crucible, which only stopped being as important as time progressed and civilization advanced. This entire region could be more accepting of crucible horns and omens alike, seeing it as a gift from the Crucible and not a curse like how the people of Lindale view it. It's unclear whether or not this big tree is a part of the Crucible or has relations to it, and that this was an Erd tree that got destroyed, since it's only because of the Erd tree that the Crucible faith died out, and now that this Erd tree is dead, it would make sense to bring back the faith in the Crucible. This bright blue area depicts a player fighting a hostile NPC, which is clearly not a red NPC invader, but rather similar to the page NPCs you fight in the base game that already exist within the world. We see this shot again with a new gravity weapon, spell, or Ash of War with its distinct purple lightning effect, which is found in current gravity-related items. And weirdly enough, I didn't think much of this creature at first other than the fact that it was hideous. But I noticed the animation it does in this clip is almost the exact same as the animation used by the Elden Beast in some of its attacks. It even makes a near-identical audio cue. This silly looking creature looks like a boss at the end of a dungeon, like Astol or Regal Ancestor Spirit, but again, this is another design that feels like it's straight out of Bloodborne, which is most likely From Software's way of telling us that this is as close as we're gonna get for Bloodborne on PC. Side note, is it just me, or do his glowing blue eyes match the ones inside the hollowed out head of this golden lion? It looks like they took the head off of one of these and used it for the glowing eye effect. And again, we see the old man who we talked about earlier with the exact same crest or medallion as the one in the painting. But here he is trying to forcibly remove what looks like the runes of the Elden Ring piercing through his body and expanding in size which is now clearly stuck and unable to be removed without likely killing him. Which he doesn't seem too concerned about dying here, likely wishing for the sweet release. 
But all of this doesn't have nearly as much to talk about as Mesmer the Impaler, the character we've been shown throughout a majority of this trailer and who is likely the central antagonist of this DLC. I wanted to save everything about him for the end here because he has so much going on, from his design to his weapon of choice to the type of fire he wields. Those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death in the embrace of Mesmer's flame. The words being said here tell us that he is the harbinger of death for everyone who's lost their grace with the power of his unique flame, referred to only as Mesmer's flame. There's also a reoccurring dragon or serpent symbolism throughout his entire character design, and how he sits on his throne like a respected, or feared, lord does. I want to start off with the most obvious thing as I mentioned earlier, which is the naming convention of Elden Ring's lore. As you may know, Marika first married Godfrey, who had three kids together, Godwin the Golden, Mogwin, and Morgoth. Godwin sharing the namesake of Godfrey, and Mogwin and Morgoth both having names that start with the letter M to represent Marika. Meanwhile, Radagon had three of his own children with Renala, who were Rani, Radon, and Rikard, all red-haired children resembling their father. After this, Radagon would eventually leave Renala and have children with Marika, being the twins of Melania and Mikola. The common pattern here is that every child of Radagon has names that start with an R or has red hair, and inversely, every child of Marika has a name that starts with the letter M or has blonde hair. This is just a simplified version of the family tree. However, with the introduction of Mesmer, he actually fits this naming convention by having the red hair and a name that starts with the letter M. He resembles a child of Radagon and Marika, much like how Melania is another child of Radagon and Marika, with red hair and a name starting with the letter M. This adds up to the fact that Mesmer looks fully grown, but even calls out to his mother as we hear his voice for the first time, saying, Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of life? In plain English, this means Mesmer is openly questioning his mother, not in an act of defiance, but with a lack of understanding. And his mother, who we can assume is Marika at this time, based on how closely she's tied to this DLC, pondering why she would choose someone like you, a tarnished with no grace of all things, to become a lord. Again, if the story fits how I've structured it, he would be the third confirmed child of Radagon and Marika, who they likely abandoned here in the Land of Shadow, as he has not actually seen or heard from his mother Marika in years, and doesn't really know how we could become Elden Lord besides becoming consort to Marika. He sounds clearly confused and skeptical, as if none of this makes sense to him. Which, again, it wouldn't, because he doesn't know who we are, or how we became Elden Lord in the first place. We actually hear a similar styled phrase spoken by Melania in her boss fight cutscene as well. Corpse after corpse left in my wake as I awaited his return. Melania clearly states, as I awaited his return. This is showing us that Melania had no idea that Mogwin even kidnapped Mikola in the first place, and that she is just simply waiting for Mikola to return on his own. Awaiting his return isn't a factual statement, she just doesn't know what else to do because she doesn't know where he went. Much like how Mesmer questions his mother and has no idea who we are, or how we could possibly become a lord without his mother choosing us directly as consort. The fact that these two are potential siblings really explains a lot here, given how they think and speak on assumptions. Mesmer's monologue specifically lacks a matter-of-fact tone. The evident confusion in his diction, marked by frequent pauses, reflects a notable uncertainty and hesitancy in expressing his thoughts. Regardless of what he would like to say to us, it's clear that he just wants to kill us like everything else in this game, so he might genuinely believe that we've been doing his bomb to become Elden Lord and kill us as a punishment. In the seemingly arena-styled room we find him in, there are a few notable features. First off, there's a hidden statue located in what appears to be a throne room. This is likely the same throne we see him sitting on in the official art, but located on the elevated platform in the background here where the statue and chair are both located. The statue itself also appears to be a woman holding a child, which again, if we take the Marika theory into consideration here, the statue would likely represent Marika holding Mesmer as a baby before she abandoned him in the Land of Shadow. This could have caused a lot of teenage angst for Mesmer, who ended up creating or possessing a unique flame that had the power to burn the Erd Tree, which is something only the most special flames can do, as we find in the main events of Elden Ring. Second, the symbol on the floor is the same one he wears on his cape, and is likely his own insignia. He can clearly see a symbol of his fire, which doesn't look like any fire symbols that we know of. We see a circle of what looks like two 
snakes coiled together, his insignia likely represents his lore, with the fire that he used to burn everything down, and the snakes that he likely considers family after being abandoned by his own actual family, with the snake coiled spear in the middle representing the spear that he uses that also features snakes on it, as well as a serpent being coiled around his spear. I also want to analyze his design from top to bottom. Starting from this close-up shot of his head, we can clearly see the red hair, which signifies his relationship as a son of Marika, and more importantly, Radagon. He actually only has one eye open. If you notice, the other one seems to be either closed or missing. The eye that he does have resembles the eye of a dragon or serpent, similarly to the dragon communion eyes. But these eyes are more black than his. His helmet also features a distinct red-eyed dragon, which is black all over. As soon as I saw his outfit, I immediately yelled the Drake Knight armor set out loud, because it looks almost identical to Mesmer's in its design. The wearable Drake Knight armor player set has horns, feathers, dragon wing membranes, and all sorts of materials taken from the dragons as a trophy that Drake Knights defeat, with a distinct description stating that it's also a black iron armor, which likely means Mesmer's black helmet is made from a similar black iron. Mesmer also wears wears a similar red cowl and chainmail, which are both featured distinctions found on the Drake Knight chest piece. We also see a red-orange snake coiled around him. Again, this is not grafting, it's gently resting around his body, which if you look closer appears to be a two-headed snake and not two separate snakes. You can see here my rough trace over how they might connect on screen that makes it a bit easier to see. Not only is a two-headed snake wrapped around his torso, he wields a snake-themed spear, which is probably where he gets the impaler part of Mesmer the Impaler from. It's important to note that this spear is reminiscent of the Serpent Slayer spear that we used to kill Rykard. However, Mesmer's spear is much longer and more intricate in design, and the top part of the spear looks as if the weapon is melting. You can clearly see what looks like lava or metal cooling around the top part of the spear. It's still warm and glowing orange, while the outside has mostly cooled off. Almost like the same effect that we see in the Coiled Greatsword in Dark Souls 3, which is unrelated but reminiscent. If Mesmer used this spear specifically to impale something as his name suggests, we can only assume that it's whatever he impaled that caused the damage to his weapon. He likely defeated whatever it was he was fighting, but didn't walk away unscathed. His weapon has a permanent alteration after that event, and whatever he was fighting was likely responsible for that and also probably took his eye. This spear tip clearly looks damaged and is awesome looking. I'm sure it's still completely functional as he uses it to kill us, but at the same time it looks so uneven and lopsided that there's no way it would normally look like this given where the base of the blade starts versus where the tip of the blade ends. I also noticed that the player in this fight uses an offensive shield to impale as well as a twin blade in their offhand, which has a unique insignia similar to a great rune that can be faintly seen in this shot. Well, something we already know about is the existence of the twin blades of Mikolo, which is said to be imbued with his rune, but is likely the premise of this story, that for some reason Mikola wants us to kill Mesmer and helps equip us to finish the job. It makes a little sense that he would come to us because we know that Mikola couldn't do this himself, and that he has the power of control or charming, which makes it so that even us the player wouldn't defy him. A few final things to note about Mesmer's appearance is the fact that his body has a similar structure to a godskin apostle, with his pale grey skin, serpent-like features, yellow eyes, and lanky body. This was something I immediately thought of because of the uncanny any length of his arms and legs. Now, the last major thing to figure out is the flame that Mesmer uses. In the trailer, we are told that this is Mesmer's flame. He either created it or owns it, and it's something unlike any other flame that exists within Elden Ring. I double-checked all the particle effects, and I can confidently confirm that Mesmer's flame is not blood flame, and is also not giant's flame, based on how different the particle effects look. Mesmer's flame is clearly black and dark red. There's almost no orange or yellow found within it. During my livestream reaction, some audience members pointed out that it might be a mixture of both black flame and destined death, because apparently, Black Flame could once slay the gods, but when Malekith sealed Destined Death, the true power of the Black Flame was lost. But what I think is more likely is that this flame could literally just be Mesmer's flame, as the trailer said, a completely new and unique flame that he owns or created. I even noticed a very specific symbol to represent his power on the official DLC art of him. If you zoom in on him sitting on his throne, you can see something that looks like it's in the shape 
of a heart with something sticking out of it. Given that this is a fire that resembles a heart, I was able to find a real-world connection in the form of the Sacred Heart, which is found within an actual religion. I'm not exactly an expert on this sort of thing, but based on what I found, the burning Sacred Heart featured in the Catholic religion symbolizes a few main concepts, like the thorns representing suffering, the heart itself representing love, and the fire surrounding it emits a light that no darkness can extinguish, which sounds perfect in a land of shadow void of all light. This real-life parallel inspires my last theory. What if Mesmer believes he's doing the right thing? And I don't mean in a conceited villain way, but more like a tragic hero. We were told that this land of shadow is consumed in an unimportant or pointless war that is tearing the people who live here apart. We don't know what the reasons are for the war, but it was only after this war started that Mesmer burned down the tree. Maybe he saw people following the Erd tree committing wars and crimes as disrespect. He might have decided to take it upon himself to cleanse this land with his flame and save people from themselves. I mean, if following the Erd tree just brought war and destruction, before Mesmer even ever intervened to destroy it, Mesmer likely believed that he was saving them by doing this and was actually trying to help get rid of any influence of the Outer God or the Erd Trees. He willingly plunged this land into darkness because he wields a flame that has a light that no darkness can extinguish. Going back to the parallels of the Sacred Heart, he has also suffered himself by likely being abandoned by his mother and growing up alone as an outcast who probably found refuge amongst dragons or serpents to take care of him. It's not the first time we've heard about someone joining the serpent family. The serpents being family is something that is directly portrayed by Reichardt, which can help explain Mesmer's serpent-like appearance. He was raised by the serpents in place of his parents Marika and Radagon abandoning him. He probably felt like they even forgot about him, and during this time he likely still loved his mother, which again reinforces the idea of the Sacred Heart. We can tell he still loves his mother, or at least cares for Marika despite her abandoning him, because he was more concerned with the fact that she chose us, rather than the fact that she's not even here to see him in person, and he might believe that she sent us instead. It could be that we are the real villains here by setting out to kill him, for doing what he believes is saving the people of this land. It's even stated that Mesmer only seems to kill those without grace, which is something pretty much everyone in the capital does already, and would agree with just like his mother's golden order. Order. Mesmer also seems to only be trying to save people of the Land of Shadow, because without him doing what he did, they would still be waging endless wars against each other. These people were supposed to come together and unite under the Erd Tree, but even with its influence, they chose to fight each other instead. This could likely be the reason that Mesmer decided to burn everything down after the war already started and take matters into his own hands, because he saw just how miserable everyone was from war and fighting, and potentially how the gods or the Erd Tree did nothing to stop it. He probably figured anything would would be better than obeying this mysterious tree that can't even stop people from killing each other in pointless wars. All of this could explain that at least in Mesmer's eyes, what he's doing is better than what the people are going through, and he made a difficult decision to save them from themselves and these outer gods. Even if some people like us think he's a villain for it and come to murder him after, really showing us that we are once again sort of the bad guys. Similar to how the actual endings for Elden Ring, the good endings aren't necessarily good, or at least not perfect. And some of the endings, we actually are doing something bad. Even in what's likely the canon, ending with Ronnie, Ronnie takes all the influence of the Outer Gods away, so people learn to take care of themselves and live on their own. But that's quite horrifying to suddenly pull the plug on people who have lived alongside the gods for hundreds of years to all of a sudden disappear without a trace, forced to figure out the rest of their lives on their own after having every decision made for them for as long as they could remember. There's no doubt that Ronnie's ending is the best possible ending after seeing how all the gods ruined everything before, so taking the direct influence away from them and letting people live their lives how they see fit allows them the freedom to do as they please. This would no doubt still come with some negative drawbacks that not everyone would be completely safe under or agree with. Ronnie's ending was a difficult decision to do what she believed was best for everyone, and even though the outcome wouldn't be a perfect one, it would cause less harm than good compared to what the gods did such that this is the best solution to fix the lands between. Much like how in my theory, Mesmer's decision to cleanse everything in his flame was how he saw fit to fix the Land of Shadow. This wasn't a perfect solution by any means, but in his eyes it would somehow lead this region to more positives than negatives. There's always more to Elden Ring's stories and how there is almost never a genuine happy ending in this franchise, and that the DLC will be no exception to that rule, forcing us, the player, to become inherently bad once again. But hey, 
That's just a theory. Again! Okay, new update. We have confirmation on who Mesmer really is. This comes directly from the Japanese interview where Miyazaki confirms a lot about Mesmer. I would like to add that, yes, again, I was significantly correct in my initial theories of Mesmer. Miyazaki confirmed that Mesmer is a hero much like how Godfrey is considered a hero, and Radon isn't technically a bad guy either. We've seen this heroic trait before, that not everyone we fight or kill in the base game of Elden Ring is inherently a bad person. He even confirmed that Mesmer is literally the son of Marika directly. He doesn't confirm if the father is Radagon, but again, with the context clues I went over, it makes sense that he is. Miyazaki also confirms that Mesmer is in fact a demigod, much like Godric Melania, Radon, and Rikard specifically. But this last part blew my mind as soon as I put the pieces together. It was in front of us the whole time. Miyazaki states that the chair Mesmer is sitting in is in the exact same style of the chairs that we see when we fight Morgoth. All of these chairs are owned by children of Radagon, not just Marika, as even the half-siblings of Radon, Rikard, and Rani all have their chairs shown and named. However, right after Morgoth mentions Godric's chair, you can see a significant gap between the next two chairs which belong to Mikola and Melania. Morgoth even glances over it slowly, almost as if there should be another chair here, because I mean there's an awkward amount of space if you think about it. All of the other chairs seem to be more or less equal distance from each other, unless the twin siblings are moving their chairs further away from Godric out of spite. This would perfectly fit Mesmer and exactly where his chair should be. The one that he's shown sitting in is the exact same design as all the other ones, and there's more than enough space to put his chair here, but it's hidden away like we are told the veils are meant to hide the land of shadow. So Mesmer was royalty like his siblings, only he got the nameless king treatment and was shunned or scrubbed from the history books. Which means Marika is almost 100% hiding this area from the rest of the world and leaving a giant gap where Mesmer's chair likely should be. The gap between Godric's chair and Melania and Mikola's chairs feels way too wide to be pure coincidence of just not liking each other and moving their chairs away. This has to be where Mesmer's chair belongs. Anyways, thanks for watching. I legit did not sleep all day to write this out and researched every single frame and detail in this trailer. I hope I did a decent job of explaining something, or at least pointing everyone in the right direction, as this video ended up getting delayed because for the first time ever, Miyazaki isn't being cryptic and is actually telling and confirming pieces of the lore to us, via interviews that aren't even in English. And of course, I did get help from my YouTube livestream chat, where I was livestreaming the reveal event to bounce my ideas off in a live reaction to the trailer, and how I've been working non-stop since the reveal, because I didn't want to be just another channel that pumped out a video stating the most obvious parts of the trailer out loud. I wanted to get in as many niche areas as I could and specific details that no one else was talking about, which is why I made sure to take my time with this, and thankfully I did, because even though Miyazaki's interview made me have to go over everything from the beginning as I was just about to finish editing this video and make sure that there were no inconsistencies through the last 20 pages that I wrote, most of my theories were proven right, or at least still stand strong even after he confirmed some very specific details that were previously unknown to me when I first started making this video and Script. I just hope you guys can see how much effort I put into this video, if you couldn't already tell by the lack of sleep in my voice, or the 20 pages of almost 10,000 words that I wrote in less than 24 hours to get all of this information in one place. Be sure to leave a like if you made it to the very end, and if this video does well, I'd love to make more Elden Ring lore breakdown videos in the future. As always, I'm Cyrobe, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.